wonderful. Thank you, Aunt Elizabeth. He sure is ugly. Tommy. Well, on the outside, maybe. But inside beats the heart of a prince. Welcome to the graveyard slot, where we talk about movies past their prime time. Here, we revisit old favorites with a fresh perspective to see if they deserve more credit or if they should stay buried. I'm Sarah. And I'm Sohini. And today, we're talking about Barbie and the Nutcracker. Barbie and the Nutcracker is adapted from E.T.A. Hoffman's short story and Tchaikovsky's ballet. It features Barbie in the role of Clara, whose dull life turns around one Christmas when she receives a Nutcracker toy that comes alive and brings her on an adventure in a magical realm. Released in 2001, it was the first Barbie movie in a long list to follow. It was directed by Owen Hurley, who went on to direct Barbie as Rapunzel and Barbie of Swan Lake, and written by two people who I believe to be experts <laughs> in Christmassy movies because they have movies like Mistletoe Over Manhattan and The Christmas Elves in their repertoire. Wow, you were right. We were in good hands with this one. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to discuss this movie because we were so pleasantly surprised by Barbie in The Princess and the Pauper and wanted to see if this Barbie movie holds up as well. We know Princess and the Pauper is the certified best, but it has been overlooked by many and it might very well also be the case for Barbie and the Nutcracker. I grew up with this movie. I didn't remember much of the movie going into this rewatch, but it was a big part of my growing up. Yeah, it definitely seemed to be a Christmas classic for many people. I can't remember anything about this movie down to not even being able to remember if I ever watched it. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I have any sort of history with this movie, but I liked Barbie a lot as a kid. And just like with Princess and the Pauper, I wanted to see if I would like it now that I don't have that attachment to Barbie as I did as a kid. The critical consensus seems to be pretty positive. Too positive, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> One critic called it like luster, but a lot of other critics gave it praise. And even the negative reviews mostly harp on this mediocrity, which honestly, I'm leaning more towards those than the high praise. And I like this movie. Even well aware of how well this movie did and how big of a deal it was when I was growing up, the critical reception is quite surprising to me. I think it honestly is very telling of the expectations we had at the time for a production like this. And I don't mean that in a bad way, I just mean it's very informative. There's quite a bit of praise for the animation, which from our current perspective is perhaps less deserving. Yeah, for sure. I think the expectations at the time when this movie came out must have been very different compared to the standards that we hold animated movies to today. And especially computer-generated animation. But yeah, I think given when this movie came out, it broke new ground, so to speak, yeah. considering, you know, this was the first Barbie movie and they really went all out, I think, in trying to stay faithful to the choreography in the ballet. There was a short making of film online and I saw from there that they used motion capture technology. And they actually had dancers from the New York City Ballet do these dances and they used the technology to capture their movements, which is why in the movie it looked so realistic. Yeah, no wonder. Yeah, and they had the master in chief from New York City Ballet, Peter Martins, choreograph the dances. So yeah, I think even given the constraints of technology at the time, they did their best. They did a really good job. That's amazing. Yeah, I think so too. I saw some trailers as well and they were really putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that after 40-something years of popularity, Barbie finally has her first full-length feature film. And so I guess they had a lot of faith in Barbie's popularity, which is why I guess they spared no expense. I mean, this was 2001, so Barbie was the leader in the market, and this was pre-Bratz, this was their heyday. And how much thought they put into this production was very apparent in the actual doll itself, because from this movie, we got the Clara doll, and it was so beautifully made like if you compare it to the later dolls coming from barbie movies it's like leagues beyond the later dolls it's like a bit of a collector's item we will be talking about this movie chronologically as usual and we start with a really fun opening sequence where we get this beautiful piece yeah the music was adapted from tchaikovsky's ballet and it was performed by the london symphony orchestra 
I really like the opening scene. I think it's also very telling of what the rest of the movie is gonna be. It's very much focused on the ballet and the music. I think that's like part of why these Barbie movies, to me at least, land so well. It's like from the beginning, they're always so heartfelt in what they were trying to do, so genuine. For lack of a better word, it's never like a mean spirited twist on an existing work. And by that, I mean like they never quote unquote adapt it into something because they think the original work wasn't smart enough or wasn't good enough or whatever it's always a love letter to the original work that's a great way to look at it i think because they were clearly inspired by the ballet and so they start off and end with the ballet the whole story is framed by the ballet and they embrace it wholeheartedly as well because we see it recurring throughout the movie the ballet is a big aspect of the story I think they have a great way of balancing putting their own twist on this because they very freely adapted this. You know, they <laughs> added, <laughs> as you might expect with a Barbie movie aimed at kids, you know, they added a lot of magical and strange and <laughs> glittery <laughs> aspects to it. But at its heart, they also embraced the source material. You can tell it's done with a lot of respect. So it's really nice to see. But yeah, like you said, the framing is Barbie teaching her little sister Kelly how to do ballet. Yes, seems like they're rehearsing for an upcoming performance of The Nutcracker. And Kelly is... Struggling. Having difficulties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> struggling. And so it starts off with Barbie telling her this tale of the Nutcracker. We transition into Clara's story, which is, of course, played by Barbie because Barbie's the star of every movie and I love it. Main character energy for sure. <laughs> But I actually really like the transition that we get here because they show a shot of the snowy window that becomes the snow in a snow globe that Clara is admiring. It's almost like instead of Clara and everyone in the story being fictional characters in Barbie's world, it almost feels like it's the other way around where Barbie and Kelly are the fictional characters in Clara's world. That is amazing. You know what? I accept that theory. That's definitely what's going on. But we get to know Claire's family. She lives with her uncle, who seems to be very curmudgeon -y. <laughs> <laughs> And I think my favorite line from him is probably his first line, where somebody comes to the door and he's like, 22 minutes early, bad manners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very relatable. They wanted Barbie to be the relatable one. Turns out it's the grandfather instead. <laughs> you know you've grown up when you watch The Nutcracker <laughs> and you relate to the grandfather instead of Clara. <laughs> That's when you know you're old. So they're preparing for a Christmas party and one of the guests is Clara's Aunt Elizabeth. When she arrives, Clara immediately wants to know about her adventures because Elizabeth travels all over the world and she immediately starts telling Clara about the new things that she's seen. It's immediately evident that this is something Clara's grandfather disapproves of and so because of him, Clara has led a pretty sheltered life where I guess she's not really allowed to go outside or anything <laughs> maybe not to that extreme but she's not allowed to be very adventurous she's not even allowed to sleep on the couch <laughs> yeah she better not wake up 22 minutes early <laughs> that'll be one step too far but yeah the aunt is a fancy aunt she's the fun aunt <laughs> and it's clear that claire is very enchanted by her and her adventures and she says i wish i could have been there yeah i actually really liked that the stories that the aunt tells kind of seem to parallel the adventures that clara goes on later because she says i met an emperor i sailed on a junk i had my first rickshaw ride and i hiked the great wall of china and it's kind of similar how <laughs> she meets a king well he's gonna be a king he's a prince at that time okay she meets a prince she sails no she doesn't because the, the sea gets iced over but <laughs> there's a chariot and she walks a lot uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, no. I, you know, I was following you until the Great Wall of China, and that's why I was like, wait, how? I said it's similar, not the same. 
But the actual parallel is when her aunt is talking about dancing with a king and she says, I couldn't say no to the king. And Clara's like, you must have felt like a princess. And it kind of feels like foreshadowing to Clara being the sugar plum princess. And she says the same line at the end of the movie when she's dancing with Eric that she couldn't say no to the king. So I really like the parallel to Clara and her aunt. That's really nice. See, instead of, of a parallel, I came up with a theory. <laughs> and I think you'll get on board. As we'll discuss more later, the stuff that we find out is a little confusing about how things could be. But we transition into the next scene and the aunt says like, oh, you should come with me next time. And Clara's like, obviously I can't do that. But the aunt says, wait until I give you your gifts or something to that effect and gives them their gifts. Like Clara and her brother, Tommy. And she says, like, this is how you'll be able to come with me next time. And it's kind of a throwaway line. They don't really, like, come back to it. But then we see how the movie unfolds. And so I'm like, so did the aunt know about the Nutcracker? And obviously, she brings Eric in later at the end of the movie. So I'm like, she's involved somehow in this. And she knows some kind of magic or whatever. And my theory is that she, or not my theory, what should have been the case is that she is the sugar plum princess. That would have made so much sense. And she also says that Eric's dad is a close friend of hers. And we know in the story that the king told Eric about the Sugar Plum Princess. That would have made so much sense. Right? I can't believe they didn't do that. Yeah. And it makes sense because like the Sugar Plum Princess ultimately is the one who helps Eric find Clara. Even if like it was still the case that Clara had to be the one who saved them. Even if like Clara has to be the Dorothy, that means like the Sugar Plum Princess does have to assist Eric in finding her. And she does. So it's like it all ties together. Yeah, and I think that would have helped patch up a lot of holes in the story as well. Because the main thing I was confused about is the connection between the two worlds. Yeah. How freely can you travel between the two of them? My problem was like, she could only come back using the necklace. But if she's still small, theoretically, she could just come back through the mouse hole. They kind of made it seem as if like, once you go there, you're kind of stuck. And I get that it would be difficult to come back, but you could. Or like, after Clara like disappears back into the human world, technically, Eric could just go through the mouse hole and they'd be, a, you know, a peculiar couple, but they, they'd be together. Yeah. <laughs> they can make it work. But yeah, how does he get back to life size? afterwards like I, there's so many questions and i think the ant being the sugar plum princess could have resolved a lot of those yeah fixes all of them that seems like a bit of an oversight because they were so bent on barbie being the main character to the max to the extreme like she's not only clara but she's also the princess i feel like she was already such a main character she like, is the sugar plum princess could just be like the fairy godmother like <laughs> yeah so Clara's aunt gives her a present, which turns out to be a nutcracker toy. Her brother immediately breaks it. <laughs> <laughs> or rather, her brother immediately wants it for himself, and then they fight over it, and that breaks it. I guess its arm goes kind of loose, so Clara makes the toy a little sling. Yeah, that was very cute. Although, like, I thought it was going to be, like, a character feature. Like, you know, the Nutcracker will so forth wear a sling, but he doesn't. He takes it off. <laughs> yeah, he didn't need it. He's like, thank you, but I'm a toy. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Why even have the sling? What was it supposed to tell us? Was it supposed to tell us that Claire is caring? Resourceful, maybe? Just like from a storytelling point of view, it could. It was just like, Meaningless. wait, the sling thing was cute. And then you just <laughs> set it aside, whatever. Okay. Yep. But Clara falls asleep. Yes, so she falls asleep and midnight strikes. And you start to see magic swirling around the room. And I actually really love this part. It was in this moment in the movie where I'm like, oh wow, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back to being like a child. Because it's very much, I don't know, it feels very Christmassy. Because like the room is very dark and cozy. And then there, there are these sparks whizzing around the room and they're slowly turning things to life. And it's quite a long sequence. And this is basically how things will go moving forward. A big part of the movie is just these sequences with really beautiful music. So it's very, it feels very much like a ballet in that sense as well. And I say this in a positive sense, but this movie is very much a vehicle for the Tchaikovsky pieces in the best way possible. 
it feels very deliberate in these choices. Like it doesn't rush the moments. Yeah, the magic. Yeah, it doesn't rush the magical moments, especially when we see the ballet going forward as well. It really takes the time to let audiences appreciate the dances and the music. And especially this scene, I think it captures that feeling of something magical during Christmas as well, like the essence of Christmas for kids when it's nighttime and they're expecting Santa down the chimney any minute. I think it just captures that anticipation and that magical sense really well. Yeah. You're right. Also, the sense of like magical things happen when you're not looking kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> On the subject of, you know, appreciating the ballet, I really love how the ballet and the music especially is very much still a main component. And this isn't like an adaptation to make it into something else. It's just another iteration of it. And what's so lovely is that it's woven into the theme as well because Clara finding herself and her courage throughout this movie is depicted through the way she gets comfortable with ballet and it's interlinked with the character development and the story and the theme so well. So yeah, you're right. It's not at all an afterthought or a hint. It's, it's very much a central part of the movie. But the magic wakes up the nutcracker and now it's alive and there's also an army of mice <laughs> running around <laughs> for some reason <laughs> and they start fighting and it's a really long fight scene and the thing is as a ballet this would be beautiful like you see the dancers you know it's a fight choreography and stuff as we see later on in the movie there are these dancing sequences that are beautiful even though they're computer generated and not from our eyes in 2022 they're not the most well-made animation but even then it's still really pretty and you can see like the dance moves and stuff but this isn't the same thing like this doesn't feel as choreographed or whatever i feel like it's a little long i remember we were watching this movie and we were talking through this whole part and we're like oh no we missed the fight and then we looked at it and it, it, it's still, still going. going on <laughs> they were still fighting but for sure the choreography fell a bit flat here and i think they could have made more effort to incorporate some moves from ballet in this even if it's mice and not human characters yeah this one scene i'm surprised that they didn't because there wasn't any hesitance to do it for the rest of the movie but this one scene should have been more ballet-ish <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense to me as well because dance and fighting are both things that you choreograph. So there's so many opportunities here to integrate ballet moves into this and to make the choreography for the fight so much more compelling. It feels like it would have been the natural thing to do, so I'm just surprised that they didn't. But within this fight, the Mouse King turns Clara into a miniature as well. Yeah, so Clara learns that the only way she can be turned back into her original size is if the Sugar Plum Princess reverses the spell. And they travel through the mouse hole where the mouse army came from into this magical land. And the falling into it kind of reminded me of Alice in Wonderland, you know, down the rabbit hole. It reminds me of Enchanted. Ooh. You're right. That is also a great parallel. But when they arrive, they're greeted by a fairy who is played by Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> she leads them to this horde of other fairies and they start dancing around her and it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's also this one part where Kelly pulls Claire along by her finger and it's so cute. It's almost like the fairy knew about Clara. All the fairies throughout the movie seem to flock to her. It's like they're drawn to her and they're also the ones who encourage her to take the first steps and join along. So maybe they have an inkling as to who she is. I feel like if they had a more solid idea of how exactly Claire is the sugar plum fairy it would have been really interesting like this is a whole backstory you know that the fairies followed the sugar plum princess and she disappeared and now they could sense that she was back or whatever this is a really interesting thread that they don't really touch on again later and, you know, when it was revealed that Clara is the Sugar Plum Princess, I was joking about how did she pick up ballet and, like, 
a couple of days time. I think the fairies knowing that she was the princess would have tied into Clara's development really well because it would have been more apparent to us that it's not that she doesn't know, quote, ballet. <laughs> Obviously, that's like a symbol of her true potential. It's not that she doesn't have it at all, it's that it's in her, but she's just holding herself back because she's unsure. And I just think the fairies are an underused tool here. And it circles back to Kelly and what Barbie was trying to teach her through this tale. Because Kelly's whole thing is that she needed to be more sure of herself. Exactly. To me, the part where Clara starts to try to dance along is a lot about her breaking out of her learned box. Obviously because of the life that she's led in her uncle's care and finally being able to try all the things that she's dreamed about doing. So that's the very surface level reading, but layered onto the whole sugar plum princess mess. <laughs> it's a bit of a thinker. <laughs> <laughs> but the magical dance actually paves the way for them to find the magical land that they need to go to, which is Parthenia, if I'm not mistaken, is what it's called. Yeah. And the fairies run off as they go to Parthenia. And okay, the Nutcracker keeps making these claims that isn't exactly normal and no one bats an eye. And I guess Claire is the only one there, but like, I feel like the movie does kind of treat it as a comedic thing, but like his environment, I guess, just dead silence in the best way. Like he keeps making these outrageous claims and we find out later why he can make these claims, why he knows so many things, but how peculiar he is makes for kind of great comedy at this point in the movie. <laughs> in this juncture, he says, the fairies are probably off to cause a storm somewhere. <laughs> it's like the whole like old man yelling at cloud thing, except he's from a different universe. So he's <laughs> yelling about like really inconceivable things. <laughs> and you just have to be like, uh-huh, sure, the fairies are off causing a storm. <laughs> it's clear at this point I was having fun with this movie. <laughs> yeah, but also Clara does take it in stride really quickly. Yeah. Like she spends very little amount of time being phased by all this. And initially, I'll give it to her, she thinks it's a dream. So Hedy, if some magic mouse turns you into a miniature, won't you be like... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> nothing else can face me after this. <laughs> okay, fair. So the Mouse King gets word that the Nutcracker and Clara have arrived in the kingdom. And he hears this news from this bat named Pim. And we immediately learn that this character is the comedic relief, I guess. And I quite like the back and forth of the mouse and the bat. I don't know how to explain <laughs> what's happening with them. It's fairly complex. <laughs> There's some class dynamics going on. Yeah. They're both very British. Uh-huh. <laughs> but with very different accents. Yeah. I like how these Barbie movies never seem to shy away from this kind of storytelling, which I wouldn't think any story could shy away from that kind of thing. I mean, like, then what story are you trying to tell if we don't discuss anything, you know? But I couldn't help but notice this thread from the very first scene we get between the bat and the mouse king. Yeah, they definitely have a dynamic that speaks to something deeper. When it comes to making movies for kids, it's easy for people to get lazy because the kids aren't going to know if there's social commentary or whatever. But here, it seems like they put some extra thought into it. So that's good. Now that I'm thinking about it, it is interesting that we understand that it's not that oh it's the movie doing a bad thing and portraying these stereotypes it's the movie commenting on these stereotypes maybe it's not immediately apparent but you know a lot of credit there it's decent writing i think a part of it is the dialogue pim does have certain lines that are self-aware just the way he's characterized i think they did a fairly decent job in making sure that they're not resorting to stereotypes but they're actually making that decision consciously with a purpose. After this, we see Clara and the Nutcracker exploring the area and they find this village that looks to have been you know, demolished by presumably the Mouse King's army. And they run into these two kids and their horse, Marzipan. <laughs> <laughs> Can't forget about Marzipan. Is it because he's made of marzipan? Could very well be that the horse is also made of candy because everything is made of candy. And it's so jarring to me. But again, Clara is like, yeah, seems about right. <laughs> 
but they take the kids under their wing and then they go on their way to find a safe place for them. And this is where they run into the Mouse King's army. They're running through the forest and they find an escape and climb up the ladder into the trees and i don't know who these people they're like civilians i guess who are hiding out but it seems like it's a rebel group against the mouse king and among them is major mint and captain candy <laughs> <laughs> But we also find out some backstory, which we also got a, a bit of from the kids, that there used to be this prince named Prince Eric, and he wasn't a very good prince, <laughs> and that's how the Mouse King took over. And here we also learn that Captain Candy was a friend of Prince Eric. It seems that it's not false that Prince Eric was the best, but Captain Candy doesn't seem to think that he's a bad guy either. Because every time, like, they badmouth Prince Eric, he's like, hey, he was my friend. But he doesn't say, like, hey, that's not true. He was trying his best or anything. <laughs> he's just like, hey, that's my friend. <laughs> sure, he was awful, but he's my <laughs> friend. I guess the thing is, he might have been an inadequate leader at the time because he wasn't confident in his abilities or maybe he didn't feel like he would be a good ruler. So he didn't take those responsibilities that he should have as an heir. But I guess that doesn't mean he's a bad person or a bad friend. I found it really interesting, the question of was the prince really lazy and incompetent or do they just not know the truth of what was going on at the palace? Because we do get this kind of brief explanation by I think by the Nutcracker maybe that at the time the king passed on his power to the advisor the mouse king and then he took it away and I just wonder like is it that Prince Eric was inadequate or is it that he was taken advantage of by the advisor I couldn't really tell because we didn't even get any real proof that Prince Eric was incompetent because the only people who seem to be making these claims are people who weren't involved with him there was a whole thread about public perception versus what was actually happening. Or at least like I couldn't tell if this was supposed to be a story about the prince learning a lesson or about the masses learning a lesson. I think the impression I got is that is not necessarily that Prince Eric was inadequate or a bad prince. I think it's that he was unwilling to take the throne because he didn't think he was good enough. Throughout this movie, he's so unsure of himself and Clara is the one who keeps encouraging him and reminding him of everything that he's done for his kingdom. And vice versa, I think this journey that she takes with the Nutcracker also helps her realize the potential that she has. So I think it's both of them going through a similar arc where they find themselves and realize that they are stronger than they thought. I think the story was something along the lines of the king wanting to pass on the throne to his son, but his son not being sure that he could do it. And so he said something like, the throne was given to the advisor in the interim. In the meantime, he would prove himself that he could do it, that he could rule the kingdom. So I think he was taken advantage of by the Mouse King. Yes, that's the part that actually started this whole wondering for me because I'm like, okay, that's what the Mouse King told you or at least like I was in the under the impression that you should prove yourself first is coming just from the advisor and we know that the mouse king is just a bad dude that had always wanted power so I wonder like is it that Eric didn't show the courage or the knowledge or whatever to be the king or is that just the way the mouse king manipulated him you know I think it could have been a little bit of both honestly because it seemed like Eric had his doubts and I think the mouse king must have just used those it's true we don't really know where this prove yourself thing came from whether it was internal for Eric or whether his dad told him or the mouse king told him but the impression I got is that it's a mix of everything I was also under the impression that Eric is now very hesitant and careful because of everything that has happened not that he was that way when he was working towards the throne it could very well be either I think it's open to our interpretation we get a bit of a peek again at the Mouse King and his underlings. I like the Mouse King. I think he's compelling as a character. And this is voiced by Tim Curry, who is wonderful, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I found it really interesting that the Mouse King turns people into statues specifically. And it seems to be his go-to move. <laughs> He said something that was kind of interesting when he was contemplating what he should turn the soldiers into. 
he said that they should be useful and there's that obsession with everyone around him needing to be useful and fulfilling their purpose otherwise they're just disposable to him it's an antithesis to the way that prince eric comes to see himself and in turn other people as well i would guess we also see that he uses spells mainly as his weapon it seems to me that I guess you have to have the ability to wield words in order to wield magic. And I found that quite interesting. When you put it that way, I think there's so much potential, which is not necessarily explored. The way that the Mouse King's downfall eventually comes about is that one of his spells is deflected off to him. But I think it would have been interesting if we had seen him maybe mess up the wording and face the consequences of that. Yeah, well, what I thought was interesting is what it says about his character. Because while we have seen that he's boisterous and hot-headed, he's not actually portrayed as stupid or like a bumbling idiot or anything. And we see this in the way he can come up with these spells, presumably on the spot, and... If we were to look at his relationships, for example, with the bat, it's again another contrast between them that the movie implies where perhaps he's like very well educated. It seems to me like his rise to power was calculated and it's not just like brute force or anything. That makes a lot of sense. And if he manipulated Eric, again, another power with his words. And now that you mention it, every time they show the courtroom that he's always in, it kind of looks like a chessboard because the floor is checkered. You know, maybe that's another hint to this all being a very strategic offensive. As you said, it's not just brute force, but there is planning and cunning behind it. I still couldn't quite tell why I was so struck by him turning his underlings into statues but like I would expect him to like get rid of them like throw them in the dungeon or whatever but no. To me it feels like such a peculiar choice especially turning them into bookends. Mm, You're right. Again tying in with the education thing. It's that making people useful even after he's gotten rid of them. You know what I liked? Clara and the Nutcracker have a one-on-one after this And she knows immediately that he's Prince Eric because it's quite obvious and I like that. They're not like, oh, it's a movie, so we have to have Clara discover it later for no reason. They just (laughs) treat it as is. And we learn that Eric's motivation at this point is just to restore his people's happiness and nothing to do with regaining power. On a similar note, as my wondering about what the truth is about Prince Eric's past, I found it really interesting here that it seems like him learning this lesson was pre-movie. Like, that's not what his lesson is about which usually it is like you have to learn that you shouldn't just want your power back you should this should be about the people but that's not at all what his journey is here that's a good point i also really like that the reveal is very quiet and not a big deal and it says a lot about clara's character as well because no one else notices It paints her as, you know, a considerate and observant person that she catches on so fast. And that she catches on that he wouldn't want that to be immediately public knowledge. Yeah, that too. So the next day, they set off to find the Sugar Plum Princess. And this time, Major Mint and Captain Candy join the two of them. (laughs) And they're crossing this bridge when Captain Candy nearly falls into the ravine. But Eric manages to rescue Captain Candy. And I really like the way they did this because he's about to fall, but he catches the Nutcracker's hand and we see that actually he dislodged one of his arms and held it with the other one. So it's it was like one extended arm. And that was really fun because we've seen the Nutcracker keep losing one arm. So this is where it becomes useful, I guess. It comes back in a different way. And I think it's a really great way of the prince realizing his strengths as well. Because I think one aspect of his helplessness is that he's a nutcracker now. (laughs) So it feels like he can't really do anything, even more so than he might have felt before. And so the fact that he's still managing to help people, I think it just helps to show him that he's stronger than he thinks. 
Yeah. And Clara highlights this later on as well. She points out that you're fine as you are. You helped all of us get to where we are as a nutcracker. It's clear that you're just as valuable and courageous and whatever else as you would be as a not nutcracker. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I don't really get like what being a nutcracker would stop him from doing. Because like Prince Eric is just a human dude, right? Like what is so different between Prince Eric and the nutcracker? (laughs) Like having joints? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I think the Nutcracker is more useful. Like, he can detach his arm. Prince Eric can't do that. <laughs> True. I think that occurred to me when Clara highlights it because I didn't get the sense before this that the Nutcracker had any problems with being a Nutcracker. Like, a lot of his problems is feeling like he's not worthy even as Prince Eric. Like, it had nothing to do with being made out of wood. <laughs> I mean, when they were being chased by the mouse army... I did think for a second that he was falling behind just because, you know, he's more bulky than the others. So I thought that might come into play there, that he's just not as strong physically and maybe he's just more limited in his abilities. But whether it actually manifests that way, whether he actually is limited or not, is just a way of representing his perceived weaknesses that he felt as a human. I think it would be more fitting to tell that story if he was instead like made of glass or something, like a Christmas ornament. Even when he's fighting with the Mouse King in the first fight, there's a part where the Mouse King is like, you're gonna fall to pieces and stuff. And I'm like, even if he was human and he fell that far, he still would have (laughs) died. This isn't a real criticism, I guess. It's just, I can't get over it. Like to me, it feels so glaring. Like I don't understand why we're so sad that he's a Nutcracker. (laughs) Maybe it's also the mental burden of being the only nutcracker among humans. But then there's magic mice. So I don't know. Maybe he's the only one. It must be that their nutcrackers aren't alive in this world. Back to the scene where Captain Candy is being saved though. I really like the dynamic that we have here because Claire and Eric know about his true identity. And Eric is watching his friend go through all this and is helping his friend without the captain ever knowing that this is Prince Eric. It's a dynamic I would have liked explored even further. I found that split second acknowledgement of the many layers happening there really fascinating. Yeah, because the captain doesn't know where his friend is and he still seems to have a lot of trust in him. But I think it might have been nice to have him have some moments of doubt. Like, where is he? I thought if it came down to it, he would finally find the courage and would come back and help. But he's not here and all along his friend has been right next to him. I think that would have been nice to explore. That would have been amazing. I think it is a flaw of the movie that they didn't explore Captain Candy and Prince Eric relationship more i think there's a lot of potential there that they kind of squandered yeah i do like that eric seems to know enough about the lands because he knows where a well should have been and he speaks the language of the fairies that stream out of the well and he just knows so much about parthenia it seems like he cares about it a lot and maybe it's because he's learned his lesson before the movie but to me it doesn't come off as he was always like this stuck up prince who knows nothing about his people and his country and whatever But with the fairy streaming out of the well, Clara starts to dance along a little better. I like seeing that growth from when she couldn't really do it at all before. Yeah, it just goes to show that the journey is really helping her find her footing. (laughs) Quite literally. Oh, nice. (laughs) One thing that I wasn't sure if I'm reaching, but the fairies, when they stream out, all the barren lands start sprouting flowers and grass and the flowers kind of look similar to the ones that sprouted out of Clara's footsteps before. It could be another point of foreshadowing that there's this tie between Clara and the fairies and her being the sugar plum princess. Yeah, I noticed that too. I always thought the reason Clara kept reviving all of these plans and things is because she is important to the revival of Parthenia, but not necessarily that she's the sugar plum princess. But now that we've talked about that whole thing, it does kind of cement that she's a sugar plum <laughs> princess. <laughs> but they're dancing around merrily and... 
They're supposed to be gathering supplies to cross the sea of storms, <laughs> which you can tell it's good. It's going to be smooth sailing, right? Well, they don't actually have to cross it because the storm comes for them in the form of a rock monster. <laughs> Yeah, conjured by the Mouse King. Luckily, the fairies that they set free come to help them and they freeze over the sea so that they can escape. And Marzipan just appears out of nowhere. <laughs> I guess this is one of the main issues I have with the movie that a lot of the time things, things just, just happen. happen. Yeah. yeah, without explanation. And things just happen to the characters without them having to do that much apart from prince eric maybe i think this is partly a pitfall of having magic be a part of the story and not having any limitations as to what that magic can do because you can just attribute anything to the magic and get away with it but it doesn't really make for strong storytelling that's an interesting take i don't know why now that i think about it but i didn't think of this movie as that magical like, it doesn't seem like our heroes use a lot of magic. Everything around them that happens is a product of yeah, magic. Yeah, it's exactly. like when Clara is in a tough spot, what does she do? Oh, wait, there's magical fairies who can fly her away. When they're in a tough spot, what do they do? Oh, wait, there's magical fairies who can <laughs> help them escape, you know? Yeah, that's fair enough. I would say, like... This movie is very fairy heavy. I thought magic would be like wielding magic, like the Mouse King using spells and stuff. But you're right, the fairies are magic. <laughs> I just thought of them as fairies. But yes, yeah, so they... Right away into the sunset, or the fog. <laughs> They're being chased by the rock monster at first, but Eric, he's... he. Breaks the uh, he breaks the ice. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, tell me three things about yourself. <laughs> Two truths and a lie. You go first. <laughs> he shatters the ice so that the rock monster drowns. And one thing he says is, "Wood floats, rock doesn't." Which again, I think, is a great way of showing him finding his own strengths. Yeah, and it's another proof that it's better to just be a nutcracker prince <laughs> eric would have drowned <laughs> this movie keeps making the point that the nutcracker is way more useful <laughs> as a nutcracker if only the movie makes a point to show also how he's vulnerable but the thing is they don't he seems kind of indestructible like he just took off his sling and he takes his arm off and puts it back on whenever you're right Maybe if he had gotten injured somehow, if he still had the sling and then wood can be vulnerable to fire if they had had like a fire monster. Yes! And then Eric has to get close to the fire monster to shatter the ice. These strengths are supposed to counteract the vulnerabilities he has as the Nutcracker. It's supposed to like balance it out. Except they don't tell us what the cons are. Yeah, you're right. Anyway, <laughs> they do manage to get away in the chariot. And after a long, long journey, they come upon this magical island that the Sugar Plum Princess is supposedly staying at. As they're coming up onto what looks to be her palace, I guess, Clara seems to not be as keen to return to her human life because she's always craved excitement and adventure and this is where she's found it and so she doesn't want to go back. But yeah, this is the first time we see this desire to stay manifest that becomes bigger and bigger and is a big part of the story later on. While they're at the island, they're basically trying to decide like who should lead them forward. And Captain Candy, of all people, says the Nutcracker has earned the right to lead us. Oh. Not knowing that he's talking about Prince Eric. Oh, that's great. And it's one of my favorite parts of the movie. Again, like I mentioned earlier, playing into this whole dynamic that not all parties know about. It makes for a great moment that I really, really, really love. Especially because Prince Eric's whole thing is that he thinks that he hasn't earned the right to lead as king. That's a great catch. So we get to the scene that makes this movie a cinematic masterpiece. They arrive at what looks like the castle. They go in <laughs> and they literally bump into the set dressing <laughs> before they realize that it's fake. The castle was made of cardboard. <laughs> A cage comes flying down upon them and 
<laughs> the cardboard falls. And I thought that was a spectacular twist. It really is. I feel like we're kind of making fun of it, but you need to watch the scene if you haven't. You don't see it coming at all. Especially because like it's definitely a play on the medium. Like they just treat it like a castle, they animate it like a castle, and then suddenly they turn it into cardboard and it flops down and it collapses. And they portray the existence of this 2D illustration within this animated movie and it's really fun. I think this is also a great commentary about how we are trapped into the facade of some things that we're led to believe are beautiful and grand when in truth has no substance or value. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly though, this is why the ending sucks. It's like they keep being led to believe that there's this magical solution, that there's this sugar plum princess that will save them, but it's a lie. At least... <laughs> As we know it now. It's all, it's cardboard, it's make-believe. Yeah, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Believing in the grandeur and the unlimited power only to realize that it's all a facade. That's actually great. That's a great take on it. And yeah, it's one more thing that's pointing towards the Sugar Plum Princess not being real. Just before this also, Clara gives Eric a pep talk about how he's accomplished so much without the Sugar Plum Princess. And this is setting us up for them realizing that they are their own heroes. <laughs> They don't need some omnipotent sort of mythical being to come to their rescue. They can help themselves. But the reveal at the end just steps all over that. I'm so confused by the ending. I feel like up until the very end, the movie does make that point over and over and over again. It could have easily been that Clara is this magical person that they needed, that she's the Dorothy, but not necessarily the Sugar Plum Princess. Because even when it's revealed that she's the Sugar Plum Princess, it's not in the sense that like the Sugar Plum Princess was in us all along. <laughs> it's not in that sense. It's in the sense that this otherworldly entity is real and it's you and you're so special it's like the opposite of the sugar plum princess is in us all along so like they still could have done it where like clara is the magical being that they needed to kickstart all of this but in the sense that it comes down to the regular people it comes down to somebody like clara instead of it comes down to somebody very special yeah, I think that would have been a much stronger story as well, that the ordinary find their strengths and their value, and it's not something that's magical and something that translates to the viewers as well, you know, encourages them to do the same thing. It also circles back to Claire's predicament, because she longs for this adventure gallivanting across the world, but the truth is she could have, you know, special moments even in her life right now, wherever it is that she's living with her <laughs> uncle. She doesn't need her aunt to take her to the Great Wall of China. <laughs> she can have her own adventures within her circumstances, which is not to say, like, just be happy with what you have. I mean, like, she should break out of her box where she is and try, like, different things and stuff. It's not about Clara, like, finally going off on her adventures, even though she does go through that. But, like, the lesson isn't about her going off on her adventures. The lesson is about being able to make your own adventure where you are. I want to say it's because of, again, their determination to make Clara... A princess. Yeah, a, pr a princess. And that's the takeaway Kelly has from this whole story <laughs> as well. It's like more important for her to be a princess than anything else. Anyway, <laughs> Clara actually isn't captured with the rest of the group. And so she cries about it. What is it? What is she She's just sitting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She feels that there's nothing she can do, but, you know, she realizes that she's their only hope. She's got to help the others, but she still doesn't do anything about it. Again, it's the fairies who appear and magically take her to the Mask King's castle. She sneaks around and she finally finds the prisoners in a cell that looks to be empty, but her friends are actually hidden behind this false wall slash force field. I don't know why. 
it's kind of like a one-way mirror and they have this another Cinderella story moment <laughs> where Clara <laughs> has her hand on the mirror thing and the nutcracker is on the other side. <laughs> this movie obviously inspired a lot of our iconic pop culture stories, including another Cinderella story, Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, and obviously Medusa. <laughs> <laughs> After this is the fight with the Mouse King and the Nutcracker starts calling the Mouse King that rat and it's like so harsh in the moment. And wow, the Nutcracker can throw down. He's not scared to fight anymore. He's now regained the ability to wield his words and that's why he can now fight the Mouse King. Ooh. And I think it's especially a burn because the rest of the movie they never really have any real insults in it like the mouse king just calls the bat a bat and the nutcracker called the mice insolent mice so for him to call him a rat is pretty big deal in this universe you're right actually everything else it's almost like so conscious but not in a like sanitized kind of way it's very purposeful and this instance lands so well because of how the rest of the dialogue is. But yeah, the Nutcracker and the Mouse King have a fight and Clara tries to help and the Mouse King is about to shrink her even further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, into oblivion. Yeah, but the Nutcracker saves her by deflecting the spell back to the Mouse King. What really struck me in the scene is the fact that this entire movie is about Eric. Eric is definitely the main character. When you see Eric and the Mouse King go head to head, you understand that the heart of this movie and the like crux of everything is the conflict between these two people. And like, he's a really strong character, honestly. And so is the Mouse King, and they're both such strong personalities. And this scene just made it so clear that this is Eric's story. Yes, I agree. And I quite like it. As much as I love Give Us Nothing Bland Ken, <laughs> Eric is possibly the one and only <laughs> really interesting main love interest of these movies. And I guess usually this is a bad thing because it's like the female character is shunned aside and it's always about the dude. But like in here, I don't know, I liked it. I liked that we find out that this is Eric's story and the way it all unfolds is just so well done. I love it. I honestly like, I like this movie a lot. I think they avoid that pitfall of relegating Clara to the side character by having this relationship be so mutual where they're both helping each other to realize their strengths and they're helping each other be better and encouraging each other. And so when it came down to the climax and, you know, it coming down to Eric needing to save Clara, I don't think it felt like a damsel in distress thing or anything. So I don't think, again, that they needed to make Clara the ultimate hero by having her be the sugar plum princess because what happens is that eric is really injured by the fight but clara kisses him and all of a sudden he transforms back into his human form it's revealed that it was clara all along who was the one they were looking for and eric says something like your bravery led to the mouse king's defeat and it's like no it didn't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people were involved in trying to overthrow the Mouse King. It wasn't just Clara. And secondly, he was the one who just faced the Mouse King head on seconds before. So it's like trying to give Clara more credit than is due, I think. Yeah, and it's not needed either. Like before then, she was very much a part of it as well. Like, <laughs> You know, when you talked about how Eric saving Clara wasn't like a damsel in distress moment, it didn't even occur to me that it would have been like they did such a good job with that scene that it didn't come up that way at all and i'm so impressed now that you've mentioned it it's really peculiar how this all ends because like up until this point it's an excellent movie and then like i'm not even saying like it's a bad end i'm just confused <laughs> yeah that's how i feel too even the reveal of her being the sugar plum princess i don't understand what the turning point is She's been growing more confident throughout the story. We've seen that. But why does it come out now <laughs> that it's her? I guess it could be that Eric is injured, but it's not even like she realizes within herself and then she intentionally helps him. It just sort of is revealed by accident. 
so even with that reveal that she's such an important figure in this and like a powerful figure, she still feels kind of passive. It felt like nothing was in her hands <laughs> except that very ultimate decision to stay on, which the Mouse King then took that out of her hands too. Yes. I agree with everything that you said. The problem is I don't think they even know what's happening. I don't think it's them being careless. I don't think it's them being like, let's throw in the towel at the end. It's like, I don't know. I'm confused. I think they simultaneously did two very different things. Like you said, it doesn't feel like a last minute thing at all because there are these crumbs spread throughout the story. I mean, in one scene in the beginning, the locket that she wears, that's literally taken from a ballerina ornament. At the same time, it's like the story itself is trying to go in a much <laughs> different direction and it doesn't really come together at the end at all. Yeah, it's not even like they take a different direction, it just suddenly becomes nonsensical, or at least to me. <laughs> Like, instead of it being present in the sense that it's present in all of them, in their bravery, in their courage, because it's also present in the masses. And there's a whole thing about them finally standing up to the Mouse King and he, like, turns them into statues for that. And that's where the Sugar Plum Princess is present in their bravery. The Sugar Plum Princess should have been a myth. It should have been a belief that's just supposed to push them to be better. Literally, the words you said about bravery, that's the only thing that the Mouse King can find about the Sugar Plum Princess because throughout the movie he's been trying to find out more about her and the only description it said was kind, clever, and brave. And it could literally be so many of the characters and again, it sets us up for them to be their own heroes as I said before. And the fact that he can't find anything about her in any book it's like she's a creature of folklore, you know, that we only hear about through word of mouth. It's so anticlimactic when we realize. Also, I don't understand how Clara is the princess. Did she used to live in the magical land and then she lost her memories and was sent into the human world to be safe so that the Mouse King can't get to her because she's their only hope? Another possibility is that she is the sugar plum princess in the sense of like, not that she was one, but like she was always meant to become it once she enters this magical land. Mm. I don't know either. I think they didn't put enough thought into this whole part of the story, how the magic kingdom is related to the real world especially with the ant who seems to know the previous king it's all very muddled here's the thing i can't tell if like it is like nonsensical or if they just don't do a good job of explaining it like maybe there is an explanation there and they just they did a bad job of explaining it maybe but this is the moment where she chooses to stay and i don't know how i feel about this decision because i guess like she doesn't like her uncle i don't know it doesn't seem like she she didn't love her uncle. Grandfather. Oh, wait. I've been saying uncle this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> My mistake. The grandfather is a bit like curmudgeon-y. And like, she gets into fights with her brother Tommy. But like, even though she was quite sheltered, she seemed happy as well. Like, it, it's not like a Cinderella thing where like, you see that she has a really shitty life and stuff. I was under the impression that these are her family in the sense that she cares about them. So I don't know how I feel about her, like, choosing to stay. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess it could be a case of her loving her family, but finding her life so unfulfilling that it's sort of like a heightened version of, you know, leaving the small town to pursue something bigger for yourself. Except, you know, she doesn't say goodbye to them or anything. So I get that. That's a bit harsh. <laughs> I don't think it's like bad or anything. I was just surprised. Surprised. It seems to not be a big deal for her to make this decision, I think it's the thing. Because she can't come back. It's not a thing where, like, I'll go back and forth. I honestly thought that's what it was going to be. That now that she's the princess, she can, you know, she has magic. She can just go back and forth. That would have made so much sense. And then she can just, she can do both. She gets to live this quote-unquote sheltered life, but in secret, she's actually, like, a Narnia thing. Like Canna Montana. <laughs> <laughs> But they're celebrating their victory and we get a dance from Prince Eric and Clara and it's beautiful. It's this whole winding sequence and it's so well done. Like the entire time I was like, wow. There must be so many kids who fell in love with ballet because of this movie. 
Yeah, it was a really beautiful sequence. And I think this is especially where you could see the amount of care they took to depict ballet and convey the delicate movements accurately. And they really let the audience revel in the beauty of it all and there's also that sense of joy from the victory over the mouse king and everything and it comes together really beautifully like i said earlier the ballet is the meat of the scene not the set dressing but after all of this beauty the mouse king actually returns on the back of the bat hey more commentary And he snatches the necklace and sends her back to the human world. And she disappears from right in front of Eric's eyes in a really heartbreaking moment. She literally fades away. I was horrified. They catch you when you don't see it coming. Yeah. It was definitely quite devastating, (laughs) to put it plainly. And she wakes up back at home and the nutcracker isn't there and she starts looking for him yeah she's telling her grandfather about everything and aunt elizabeth arrives again and this time she has a guest dun 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 who could it be it's eric it's major mint (laughs) (laughs) and he's immediately overly familiar and implies that he is the nutcracker and we get no explanations on how he got there my theory is that he used the necklace actually because necklace is still there i mean it's probably not how you use it but i'm like okay close it again and open it again maybe it'll (laughs) work (laughs) but yes eric and clara dance and they get their happy ending i guess does that mean eric and now that he's won is abandoning his people again i bet cam candy is really disappointed (laughs) (laughs) yeah I don't know. There's so much they don't explain. Yeah. So many questions in the like last two minutes of this movie. But, you know, this isn't the real ending. The real ending is Barbie finishing the tale for Kelly. We actually go through the snow globe again. And this time we see a miniature Clara and Eric dancing in the snow globe. Oh. But Kelly takes an interesting lesson from this, which is that if you do what the tale tells you to... You can be a princess too. Her line is, if Claire hadn't been brave, she would have never found out she was a princess. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the beginning when she's about to tell the story, she introduced it by saying that Kelly just has to find the courage to try. Like Clara. And then she starts telling the story, which sets up that motivation, but it just goes over <laughs> Kelly's head. <laughs> she's like, I want to be a princess too. So I'm going to yeah. keep dancing until I find out I'm yeah. a princess. Maybe Barbie's like, eh, good enough. We'll get her to dance, right? (laughs) But yes, they finally do the dance again. And Kelly nails it. This is also a really lengthy scene that I really like. And this is the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. I wonder if it would have been more tied in to the theme for Kelly to still not really know the steps that well. But now she has... But she tries anyway. Yeah, now she has that tenacity to keep trying. Not everything in life ends neatly with a big bow, and this didn't need to either. And in that sense, I do like that they didn't end with the grand performance or anything. It was just them still rehearsing and going on with their lives. So, an absurd conclusion. Barbie is really inside a snow globe, inside Clara's world. She's trapped there, and it's (laughs) a much more grim story in reality (laughs) yeah she's seen clara peering in through the snow globe and she's made up this whole story in her (laughs) head about clara's background and clara going on this adventure oh my god all of the barbie movies are actually like barbie trying to like keep her sanity by telling kelly these stories because they've been trapped in that fucking snow globe for decades as long as there is a new barbie movie barbie's still trapped in that fucking snow globe That took several very dark turns. (laughs) (laughs) And the second absurd conclusion that we can come to is that this movie is the inspirational source material for several pieces of pop culture, including another Cinderella story, Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, (laughs) Hannah Montana. (laughs) (laughs) So... What do we think of this movie? Have our opinions changed? Well, I didn't have one to begin with. Did you have any like preconceived notions though? 
Honestly, I had quite high hopes because I was so impressed by Barbie as the princess and the pauper. And also I had gotten the impression that a lot of people see this as a classic Christmas movie. So I did have high expectations. I don't think I was completely let down because there are many aspects about this movie to appreciate, but I also didn't love it as much as I did Princess and the Pauper. But that doesn't mean that it's not worth at least one watch. Would you recommend it? I think I would. Maybe watch it around Christmas time when you're feeling especially generous. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, I didn't remember this movie that well, but I knew that it was never going to be Princess and the Pauper, and I knew that it's like subpar, to put it harshly. But I liked it better than I thought I would. It was actually much more playful and entertaining than I expected. And after a discussion, I found more things to like about it than I did before. I feel like you have to go into it knowing what you're in for. Like, watch it with your like kids or something. They would love it, I think. I know that I loved it as a kid. So yeah, I think it's a great movie to watch with kids. And actually, if you want like a taste of like ballet or something. Yeah, for sure. Since this is our last episode of the year, we are having a bit of an end of year wrap up where we award some movies certain titles. <laughs> <laughs> our first category is surprisingly good. And mine is Confessions of a Shopaholic. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad. It was so much better than I expected. The whole time I was watching it, I just kept thinking, I can't believe I'm having this much fun. <laughs> like, it just never dipped, you know? And the performance honestly doesn't get enough credit. It's so natural that you wouldn't give it a second thought. But so much of the ups and downs of this movie and the emotional beats are so fucking strong because of the performance. I liked it a lot. Oh, I'm really glad. Mission accomplished. For me, the surprisingly good title would have to go to Barbie as the Princess and the Pauper. It was one of the few Barbie movies that I remembered watching as a kid and really enjoying, but I guess I was just talking it up to my admiration of Barbie as a kid. <laughs> and so I genuinely wasn't really expecting it to have such good storytelling, such interesting themes and messages, and the way everything is portrayed intertwining to be such a tight-knit and just beautiful story. I was very pleasantly surprised. That's great. <laughs> we both feel so great about this category. Yeah. Unfortunately, our next category is surprisingly bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm very sorry to <laughs> say. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that it's Twilight. Mm -hmm. I expected it to be a little better than it was. I always thought the criticisms were exaggerated. And while I do think people hate it for the wrong reasons, the movie is hard. Very hard to get through for me. <laughs> like, I'm not saying this has anything to do with, like, the actual quality of Twilight, just, like, my expectations. Like, I genuinely thought people were just being dicks, but they were being dicks, but also the movie is bad. <laughs> Fair. I'm aware of its flaws. <laughs> for me, the surprisingly bad one would have to be Letters to Juliet, because I remember liking it so much. I equated it as somewhat of a comfort movie, and upon a closer look, I wasn't expecting to dislike it so much. On the subject of less than stellar movies, our next category is Guilty Pleasure, and mine is A Cinderella Story. <laughs> really? Listen, I actually think it's a decent movie. The reason it's in this category is because so much of the main plot drives me up the fucking wall. <laughs> and after our discussion, I have such a different view of this movie and it was so grating to me, but I can't say that I don't still enjoy the fuck out of watching it because I do somehow. Fair enough. Like, it just has a certain quality that brings me so much joy, even though if I think about it too long, it infuriates me. <laughs> but just, like, the way it looks and the dialogue and everything just makes me happy for some reason. Fair enough. On its own, I have doubts about it, but at least in the canon of Cinderella movies, especially, you know, the modern remakes, I do think it adds a lot of freshness to the story. So, I mean, it definitely broke new ground. So I'll give it that. And it is fun in a lot of ways. So I can definitely see the appeal. I think part of it may also be nostalgia. Yeah. Everything with like the texting and the way everybody looks. Mm -hmm. What is your guilty pleasure, Sohini? It's gotta be Twilight. Oh, I didn't, I didn't think this would be your pick. Well, 
you know, we were talking about nostalgia, and this is a different kind. For me, it's the nostalgia of having grown up with the books. And I guess a part of me will never really be able to separate the movies from my experience of watching the books come to life. And I completely acknowledge the faults, the problematic aspects, the many things that are just no. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm not dismissing it and I'm not ignoring it and I'm not saying it's okay. It's just the nostalgia factor. We also have a peculiar category, honorable mention, which actually is Morning Glory for me. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's still a comfort movie for me. I kind of still don't see its flaws. Listen to our episode. <laughs> the stuff that we talked about are valid, but I don't actually have any problems with it. I'm like, I acknowledge that it's there. It's, it doesn't really have any bearing on my enjoyment of the movie. I want more stories about old news anchors and their plucky producer. <laughs> it has a special place in my heart. I think for this category, it's going to have to go to Scream 3 for me, which is an unexpected choice even to me. Wow. When I think about it, I think it's very unfairly rated, especially compared to its counterparts in the franchise. There were so many fun elements, so much to unpack as well. And, you know, it's not perfect by any means, but I think it's still a fun watch. I completely agree. So a very special category is coming up. And that is the worst movie. <laughs> and my choice has to be Letters to Juliet. Nobody is surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Like, what the fuck was that movie? <laughs> I have no words for it. That's all. Thank you and good night. <laughs> what is your worst movie? I think you know. I also do hate the Jurassic Park sequels, but at least I can laugh at them. You know, at least they provide a source of comedy. But Monte Carlo... I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well, to turn things around a little, let's now talk about the best movie. And I think it's no surprise that my best movie was Barbie as Princess and the Popper. It's an amazingly well-written, well-performed, and executed film. I am so fucking serious. This is a movie everyone should watch, especially if you are a fan of stage musicals. Like, I cannot emphasize that enough. It's incredible in every conceivable way. I think this is a no-brainer. So for me as well, Barbie as Princess and the Popper would have to be <laughs> the best one. It exceeded every expectation. And it's just genuinely such a good story made with so much heart yeah and it's also like even on the standards of a big budget film that's supposed to be taken seriously it's still an amazing movie it's not just amazing for what it is it's amazing in general yeah it holds up so the crowning glory of this list is the favorite and mine is hannah montana the movie I already loved this movie so, so much, but really taking a closer look at it made me think more about the narrative, and I just adore everything they managed to do with this story. And this didn't make me love it more, it just made me understand it more, and like made me like appreciate more of it, because I was already well aware that this is an amazing movie. <laughs> it's even closer to my heart now that I've picked it apart and seen all the care put into the writing of this movie, and it will always be a favorite, I think. That's... High praise. And well-deserved, definitely. For me, the favorite title would have to go to Confessions of a Shopaholic, which might seem a little bit predictable because this is one of my favorite movies. But when we discussed it in so much detail, I was relieved, I have to say, that it held up. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our final segment for this wrap-up, which is Retractions. Have either of us made any statements that we regret? <laughs> <laughs> Mine has to do with 13 going on 30. Because at the time, I did not recommend this movie because of the ending. And that's definitely my attraction because <laughs> it's a really good movie. I was just too emotional. I was too <laughs> close to it. This is honestly a pretty amazing tour de force in writing and performance. The nuances they manage to convey in regards to friendship and growing up and adult relationships that's really complex is mind-boggling. Just because I can't watch it without weeping doesn't mean <laughs> it's any less good. 
I suppose I can retract my statement about a Cinderella story. <laughs> I still hate Austin, don't get me wrong, but it still holds up, especially compared to the Staler remakes that we're getting now. I think it does add a lot of newness to the story. So I guess I could recommend this movie. It's not the worst one, so go for it. And that's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it for this is the last episode of this year. Wow. <laughs> we hope you've had a good time with us. <laughs> we will be taking a break during the month of January, but we'll be back starting February. And we look forward to dissecting more nostalgic movies and seeing if they hold up. If you have any movies you'd like us to discuss, send them in at graveyard underscore slot on Twitter and Instagram or email us at thegraveyardslot at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Graveyard Slot. Mm -hmm.